Palestine Senator, speaking on presidencies in the United States. Well, Grover Cleveland, by the way, was the first president that Franklin Roosevelt uh, met, and they had a little discussion in which Cleveland said, don't ever try to be president. <laughs> so that advice obviously was not taken, or I would not be here speaking on Franklin Roosevelt. Let me ask you this a, a question. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt is someone who is still prominent in the minds of people who are, say, 60 or over. Uh, of the next generation down, of which I'm a part, we heard a lot about him from our parents and from our teachers. How many of you in your classrooms, let me ask you this, in school, heard that when, when Roosevelt was being discussed in history class, had it taught that Roosevelt was, uh, was a great American president? How many had that as, as part of your teaching? And it looks like most of you. How many had, in fact, let's take it one step further. How many of you had it taught that he was the greatest American president? Well, there were some hands that were up there before I could even finish the, finish the phrase. Right, several. A great president, a great American president. Yes, uh, that interpretation of Franklin Roosevelt was the one that I was taught in college as well. And although I didn't get that from my parents, I certainly got it from my father in law. There were many Americans who accepted that. Now, here's something to think about. That interpretation was dominant in American history, began to change in the 1980s. We began to see a few things happening in the 1980s that began to alter that, and that is the presidency of Ronald Reagan, oddly enough, who voted four times for Franklin Roosevelt. His administration began to change perceptions of Franklin Roosevelt. Let me explain. The heart of Reagan's program was that if you cut taxes, it would spur investment in entrepreneurs who would then start industries who would create jobs and prosperity. This tactic, which Reagan believed strongly in, is the heart of the Reagan presidency. Under Reagan's administration, the tax rate went from a top level of 70%, this is on top incomes, slashed to 28%. It's no accident that Microsoft and Bill Gates were started one year from the time of the big tax cut. And if we look at the 1980s, we can either see invented or at least developed heavily during that decade many of the products that we take for granted, not just with Microsoft and our computers, although that's a big part of it, but VCRs, fax machines. Do you remember where you were when you first used or saw a fax machine? It was no doubt during the Reagan presidency. Microwave, ovens, cell phones, Walkman radio, all of this is part of the entrepreneurship of the 1980s. And what was more, the revenue side of it, we cut the taxes from 70 to 28% on top incomes. We even slashed them on lower level incomes down to 15%. With all of that tax cutting, the revenue that came into the federal government doubled during the 1980s. As someone might have said, 70% of nothing is nothing. 28% of something is something. And we found that when the tax rate was 70%, people were rushing to tax shelters. Whether it's tax-exempt bonds, coin collections, art collections, foreign investments, Swiss banks, all of this, to avoid paying the 70% income. When we saw the prosperity that emerged in the 1980s, it began to make people rethink Roosevelt's presidency because it was built on the opposite idea. The Roosevelt presidency, by contrast, is built on the idea that you raise taxes, you use the money to, fed, to fund federal works programs, then that will jumpstart the economy in various ways. It results in a very large federal debt, but it creates employment through the federal jobs. Now, when we look at that reversal program to Reagan's, you began to think, wait a minute here, unemployment was pretty high in the 1930s. It got to be pretty low in the 1980s, and a reassessment of the Roosevelt presidency became in order 
American historians. The first proof of that research was a book by a man named Gary Dean Best. And that book was entitled Pride, Prejudice, and Politics. It was a critical assessment of the New Deal written in 1990. If we look at Roosevelt, he was clearly the dominant person, the dominant president in the first half of the 1900s. If we look at Reagan, he is the dominant president in the last half of the 1900s. Now I have to say, as a professor, when you realize this, you have the dominance of Roosevelt in the first half, the dominance of Reagan in the second half, it is somewhat alarming to study their academic backgrounds and realized that both of these men were C students. <laughs> it also is distressing to go back in the last generation and to discover that the best students of the recent presidents were Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton. <laughs> One of which resigned, of course, and the other was impeached. <laughs> Nixon was offered a full ride to Harvard, and he ended up going to Whittier because he couldn't afford uh, the living conditions there in Massachusetts. Ended up graduating toward the top of his class at Duke Law School. Of course, Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. So this is a very interesting situation when you have the most successful presidents where you're C students. And the ones who were abysmal failures were Rhodes Scholars or Harvard uh, scholarship people. You know, it was worth, people started needling Reagan about this during his presidency. You know, he'd gone to Eureka College and you had a C average. And one reporter came and was finally saying, what's this about you having going to a Eureka College and getting a C average? And Reagan stopped it once and for all by responding this way. I wonder what I could have accomplished if only I had studied hard. <laughs> it's a shame that Roosevelt wasn't alive for that one because he would have enjoyed it immensely. He had a very good sense of humor, a very lively sense of humor, and would have loved that line tremendously. Roosevelt's presidency is something we need to look at here a little bit. We're going to look at his war presidency, too. I want to look at his, uh, uh, result, uh, his attempts to resolve the Great Depression because that leads somewhat into his war presidency. If you look at his programs in retrospect, now that we have the knowledge that we have of the 1980s and the tax cuts and what happened to the economy in the 80s and even went into the 90s as a result of these tax cuts, some of Roosevelt's programs look rather startling. For example, we had the first federal relief program. And the idea is we've got to feed the hungry. And we did feed the hungry, sort of. Uh, Roosevelt allocated $10 billion. The first allocation was $300 million. Now, what's interesting about that is $300 million, the states were told, if you have needs, come to us, and we will try to help you solve them. Massachusetts, at that time, said, my gosh, we can do it ourselves. We're going to have local charities. We have the Boston Red Sox. Back then, the Atlanta Braves were back in Boston. They were the Boston Braves. They would have exhibition games to raise money. You would have uh, various entrepreneurs who would give to charitable donations. And Massachusetts went through that first rush of federal welfare and said, we're going to solve it ourselves. We don't need help from the federal government. Illinois which had had trouble with Al Capone and others, took a different approach. <laughs> and they said, we need $55 million of that. And they received it. So in other words, we have our first federal welfare program. It's $300 million. Massachusetts gets zero, and Illinois gets $55 million. And you know, they were thinking back in Massachusetts as they were spending their own money for their own soup lines and their own charity cases, and it dawned on them, finally, we didn't just pay for our own poverty cases. We helped pay for those in Illinois with the $300 million funding. 
Governor Ely was ousted from office, never to run again in Massachusetts politics. And the next time we had a federal request, Massachusetts requested and received $114,500,000, which they thought was a pretty good take until they looked at Roosevelt, who got $700 million for the state of New York, more than twice as much as any other state. And it began to signal what some of the programs are all about. Many of you know about the WPA, the Works Projects Administration. Thomas Stokes won a Pulitzer Prize in 1938 for his exposure of this, for simply saying, my gosh, Roosevelt's using this as a political war chest to hand out to all the cities and states where he's having trouble. Hoover carried Pennsylvania, and so Pennsylvania is loaded with welfare that is going in to build bridges and roads all over the state. Some of them were laughing and said, I wish we voted against him, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a, an incredible uh, focusing on getting the WPA money in various states where Roosevelt had hoped to carry. We had the NRA, the National Recovery Act, which allowed businesses to get together. Uh, now get this, this is a real depression solution here. All the businesses, like all the car dealers and everybody, will get together and decide what ought to be charged for a car or their product or whatever it is then that will be the legal rate, and nobody is allowed to charge below it or else. And the NRA codes allowed, so we had a rising of prices in textiles, business after business, as industrialists got together and made codes and simply raised prices. We even had a code for tailors. They had a code that said, to press a pair of pants had to be 40 cents. You had to charge 40 cents to press a pair of pants. And so Jack McGinn from New Jersey came along, and he did something that was so heinous that it's hard to mention it before this group. <laughs> <laughs> he pressed a pair of pants, and he charged 35 cents. <laughs> when he discussed his from jail. <laughs> he said that he lamented and it would have been better to have another nickel and be out of jail rather than be minus the nickel and in jail. After a week of outrage, the judge called him and said, we're letting you go. And furthermore, the judge said, you can press my pants. <laughs> sure he had exact change and no more. The ultimate, of course, would have had to have 40 and then have him go back in jail. So uh, that's the NRA. The AAA was a fascinating program that, uh, that Roosevelt came up with. It, and this was this whole guy, uh, way of, what do you do of overproduction of farm products? And of course, the solution is you pay people not to produce. And so we have people being paid, uh, allowed to set aside a fourth of their farmland in the case of wheat and corn being allowed to take being paid ten dollars an acre not to produce. Now what was interesting about this is that you get people paid not to produce and then you had to have, wait a minute here, some of these people may grow on this land anyway. And so we had to then hire a, a swarm of bureaucrats to go onto these farms and check to make sure that they were that they were not taking, they were not planning on more than they were being paid not to plan on. And uh, these checkers then, well, sometimes they were subject to bribes. And so you had to have checkers to check on the checkers. <laughs> to go around. This, my first academic job after I got my PhD, I was a new assistant professor and I was concerned about getting tenure. And I was writing to a conference with the chairman of the tenure committee. I thought, boy, is this a chance to try and make a good impression. So we were riding to the conference, and we were talking about our backgrounds. I'm just newly hired, and I asked him about his background. And he asked me about mine, and I, I said that, or he said that he, uh, when he's going over his background, he said, I worked as a checker <laughs> for allotments for the AAA. And I was just so, I, I just blurted out, did you take any bribes? <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know how that filtered into him that the untenured member of the department was so fascinated with whether he took bribes or not. But he responded quickly, no, the best offer I got was a pair of tires, was a set of tires. The other people got the better bribes. And he was terribly upset over it. We paid $2.4 billion to veterans. <clears throat> we, we honor our veterans today, but we honored them back in the 1930s with a subsidy. Uh, we paid silver miners not to produce, well, it was polluted to produce too much silver in this case. Then the going price of silver was 40 cents a pound, or excuse me, 40 cents an ounce. And so Roosevelt, uh, with the Silver Purchase Act, raised this to 64 and a half cents an ounce. And the idea was, this will help impoverish silver miners out in Nevada. Which, by the way, Nevada happened to be the state of the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, T. Pittman, and Roosevelt wanted foreign policy concessions. And what better way to get them than to get T. Pittman on his side by raising artificially the price of silver. So instead of 40 cents an ounce, which is the world market price, now 64 and a half cents. Well, of course, the bureaucrats had this budgeted by, they said, well, so many ounces are produced each year, and that will be 24 and a half cents above the market price, and they had it all figured. What they didn't figure is that there would be a boom in silver, and that the low tripled that year. And then it went it's even more than tripling, and people said, they're, they're bringing in silver where there isn't even silver. And then they discovered that there was a border problem with Mexico. <laughs> We think of the border problem with Mexico today as illegal aliens with Spanish accents crossing the border illegally to sneak work in Texas. These were New England businessmen in three-piece suits with sacks of silver over their <laughs> shoulder. Silver, see, Mexico's a silver-producing state, and you can get it for 40 cents an ounce in Mexico and bring it across the border and get 64 and a half cents over here in the United States. So it's a lucrative business that you're talking about. When, when you talk, when you read in the 1930s about guarding the Mexican borders, it's for silver smugglers. <laughs> so we had, it, it was a wild administration if we look back on all of these things. By the way, with silver, we paid in 1935 dollars, 300,000 of those dollars a day, every day for 14 years to silver miners. So that was a large amount of cash back then. We got to the 1936 presidential election, and unemployment had not dropped much at all. Because, if you'll follow me, you do get a lot of jobs being created, but all of these payments had to be done with tax revenue. Roosevelt, uh, in, the, in, 19, in the early 30s, the tax rate, the maximum rate was 25%. By 1935, President Roosevelt had pushed it to 79%, which is to say, on top income, on the large income dollars, over 100000 which of course was a big income, that'd be over a million dollars a day. But that, that tax rate was four-fifths of everything you earned over that amount went to the federal government, and we found that investors were not, entrepreneurs were not investing in the American economy, which was perpetuating the Great Depression. In that election, we had some wild results. For example, uh, Roosevelt was concerned that crop prices would fall right before the election, and the farm vote would go to Alf Landon. Hence, Secretary Wallace, Henry Wallace, received this notice. <coughs> Roosevelt told him, and I quote, Henry, through July, August, September, October, and up to the 5th of November, I want cotton to sell at 12 cents. I do not care how you do it, that is your problem. It cannot go below 12 cents. That was the victory margin, 12 cents. Uh, Henry Morgenthau, Secretary of Treasury, said this. There, the, there were people, jobs that were supposed to end at the WPA in October. And Morgenthau received this note. Quote, no one is to be laid off at the WPA on the 1st of October. And, Mo and Morgenthau said that Roosevelt told him, quote, he doesn't give a goddamn where they get the money. The point being, this money is going to have to come in to keep these programs alive until after the November election. We took a survey of those people on relief. 17% were going to vote for Landon, the Republican candidate, 75.1% for Roosevelt. 
And so a massive relief projects that were being built in here into the economy in the 36th election. And as we know, boy, Roosevelt did real well in that election. Hiram Johnson, senator from California, who voted for Roosevelt in that election, made this comment. Now, this is someone who voted for him. He said, he was writing to his son, and he said, politics are going high. Roosevelt is exhibiting fright, although why he should, I am unable to see. It seems as clear as anything that he will be elected. Any man who could not be elected, who has gone on, uh, uh, on a train through the Middle West, he takes out his checkbook and he says, I will allot a few million dollars to this particular place and a few million dollars to some other, and who carries with him the agricultural department with checks for the farmers in untold amounts, and Mr. Hopkins of the WPA, who doles out relief in unstinted quantities, anyone who believes that he cannot win should retire from politics. He starts with probably a million votes bought. Excuse me, eight million votes bought. The other side has to buy them one by one. They cannot hope to match his money. And indeed, Lannan could not. It was one of the biggest electoral landslides in American history. Roosevelt came through with 520 electoral votes, Alf Landon, eight. And the message was clear. We need to go and get a subsidy, and the subsidy will help you get votes and get elected. Uh, what we had uh, as unemployment persisted in 1937, 1938, 1939. In 1939, for example, unemployment in the United States, according to the uh, historical uh, historical census statistics, was 17.2%, and it, that means that we had 9.48 million unemployed. That is almost 9.5 million unemployed. In 1931, when the Depression was also very severe, eight years earlier, the unemployment rate was 16%, with 8.02 million unemployed. So in other words, eight years after that, we still, we'd actually had an increase in unemployment. Every dollar that we were spending on a federal program we had to take out in a tax dollar. That dollar was no longer being invested in the economy, so you're really shifting it from invested in entrepreneurial wealth into the federal government, into a federal job. Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of Treasury, made this statement, and it's uh, a document that was there in Roosevelt Hyde Park Library. I went, wow, when I saw this one in my research. Listen to this. On May 6, 1939, here is what Henry Morgenthau said. Secretary of Treasury, friend of Roosevelt, he was a neighbor of Roosevelt. Henry and his wife uh, went to parties with Eleanor and Franklin. They were good friends, friends for decades. And Morgenthau was Roosevelt's Secretary of Treasury. And he says, quote, we have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not and I have just one interest. And if I am wrong, somebody else can have my job. I want to see this country prosperous. I want to see people get a job. I want to see people get enough to eat. We have never made good on our promises. I say that after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started. And an enormous debt to boot. Results, the lack of diminishment of unemployment has created in the historical profession a change of attitude somewhat about Franklin Roosevelt. Gary Dean Best wrote his book in 1990, Pride, Prejudice, and Politics. He wrote a sequel called The Critical Press and the New Deal. Gene Smiley has written a book, Rethinking the Great Depression, and Jim Powell, just this last month, released a book called FDR's Folly. All of these books critical of the New Deal, a body of literature that simply did not exist <coughs> until the 1980s. All of this makes a difference. Roosevelt's attitude towards spending and the fact that, that it didn't work very well <coughs> fits in to World War II in a couple ways that you might find interesting. At first, it seems like World War II and then the Iraqi War which we're currently engaged, 
Japanese attack, there was no attacking base, at least was on a military installation. In some ways, and my wife Anita and I were talking about this, and she made a good point. When the terrorists hit the Pentagon, tragic as it was, in some ways, historically, that has always been fair game for attack. And there aren't children and civilians very much in the Pentagon. It's like Pearl Harbor. It was a tragedy, it was a sneak attack, but when you're operating a military base, you must be prepared for some kind of warfare. Thus, an attack on the Pentagon fits typically with historical military fighting in that respect, and it fits with Pearl Harbor. What is different here is the sneak attack that is on civilians in the World Trade Center and makes this different. Another difference, which I'd like to think about too, Franklin Roosevelt, in organizing the war, well, let me start first with Bush. Bush is trying to, President Bush, trying to build a coalition. Even though the United States could do much of this alone, not all of it, I'm saying, but much of this the United States could and is doing alone, President Bush is nonetheless trying to build a coalition. With President Roosevelt, it's very different. He had an existing coalition already in place the minute the United States was at war there. But oddly enough, Roosevelt thought he could do it alone himself. Part of the interesting thing about Roosevelt is, after going through the Great Depression, going through these various events, his big election victories persuaded him that he had enormous powers of persuasion, and that if he could be turned loose on foreign dignitaries, he could bring them along to his line of thinking. For example, and I quote, a conversation that Roosevelt had with Churchill went in the following way. Roosevelt said this, quote, I know you will not mind my being brutally frank when I tell you that I think I can personally handle Stalin better than either your foreign office or my State Department. Well, as a professor, I'd have to say I grade him lucky to give him a C on his handling of Stalin. <laughs> Stalin ended up in Poland and much of Eastern Europe. Roosevelt had very little to show for it. But Roosevelt felt he could get the job done. In that respect, they're similar. Roosevelt and Bush both have an optimism that's necessary to conduct a war efficiently. You can't be down in the dumps, as Hoover was in the Great Depression, looking for depression around every corner. You had to believe that you could do something that would work. And I'll have to say that. Roosevelt had a, a, a dominant, optimistic spirit, uh, attitude and spirit about it, even during his fight against public war, tremendous optimistic spirit that he brought into the Great Depression and into World War II. The other difference that I'd like to point out is the attitude toward war on the issue of taxes. President Bush may be the first, or at least one of the first, commanders in chief to have a tax cut coming into a war. Reagan Bush has learned from his father's mistake and for breaking success. And the idea is, if we cut taxes, we can spur entrepreneurship, and even increase revenue coming into the government. Roosevelt's attitude was quite different. When war was declared, Roosevelt looked at that 79% tax rate and said, too low. Some people said, you mean 80s? And Roosevelt said, with that smile on his face, cigarette, too low. And some said, 
solution. 99.5. That means, this is on all income above 100,000. If you earn hypothetically $200,000 back in 1941-42, you would pay on that second $100,000, you would receive 500 of it and give 99,500 to the federal government. Well, as this program is going before and being discussed in Congress, you always have that person who comes in with a question like, why is the emperor wearing no clothes? That congressman asked the question, in Illinois, we have a 2% state income tax. <laughs> Whoops. If they have a 2% state income tax, and the federal tax is 99.5. <laughs> These people will pay in more than they make. <laughs> and so the 99.5% solution was not accepted by Congress. It did not pass. And thus, on April 27, 1942, April 27, 1942, Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order for a 100% income tax on all income over $25,000. I was willing to let them have a half percent, but they wouldn't take it. Now it's 100% on all income over $25,000. One concession made was this. If you made 25 and your wife made 25, you could make 50 and then it would be 100% over your joint return. This became an issue in the 1942 midterm sidetracked the United States in some ways for war. The Republicans won overwhelmingly many seats in Congress, did not capture control of Congress, won many seats, 100% tax was repealed, but in its place was put a 90% tax on all income, over $100,000. And thus the United States had in the war restrictions on entrepreneurship that caused difficulties inventing and developing technology that could have been helpful as the war progressed. One of the big differences then, as we look at President Bush, and as we look at Roosevelt, is Bush's experiment. Will the tax cut idea, as we go into a war, work better than the tax hike idea? We're going to see history as such that we learn from history, we see mistakes. If we can develop and learn from history, we can more credibly solve our problems today. Thus, as we look at Roosevelt, a presidency, an optimistic presidency, a dominant presidency, in some ways a presidency that the next generation, that we, when we went to school, were told that was a very successful presidency. Because of what we have seen happen in the 1980s, because of the emphasis on entrepreneurship and tax cuts. And we're going to see whether the Bush tax cuts and the development of the Iraqi war, how that affects uh, American economic development and American military development. All of this will be eyed carefully by historians, by contemporary politicians, to see what will be the programs, what will be the attitudes that we will bring into government in the next generation. If the Bush policy has some success, combined with the Reagan tax cuts, our children and our grandchildren may be hearing very different views about the Roosevelt presidency from those that most of us experienced when we went to high school and to college. Thank you very much.
I think uh, I'd like to start with the first question. My prerogative up here. Um, Bert, what do you think of the, uh, the, the whole uh, ability of the historical profession right now to go into the archives? You mentioned the number of books. When will these interpretations that you're talking about actually make an impact in the classroom? Sort of trickle down from the high scholarly activity on into the classroom. When are you going to see, when are our children, for example, going to be getting the different interpretations of Roosevelt? That's a very good question. And it, it's very good because I thought this trend was going stronger than I found out it was. David Kennedy at Stanford University won a Pulitzer Prize for a biography of Roosevelt called Freedom from Fear, which echoed some of the same old interpretations that Roosevelt's, that these programs did get us out of the program. However, even Kennedy was more critical than had been before of Roosevelt. I think that what we're going to see is in the next generation, next 10 years or so, some criticism being leveled right away. Because historians, when they write a textbook, have got to somehow explain how it was that there was so little unemployment in the 80s, in the late 80s especially. And the policies that were done there, and then so much employment, unemployment in the 30s, it creates a very difficult situation trying to explain both. So I think we're going to see some criticism right away. I think, however, given the mindset often of many historians, it may be another full generation, by that I mean it could be 30 years, before we're going to begin to see wholesale interpretations, where we begin to look at the Roosevelt presidency and say, hey, this didn't work. I'll say again, as I said in my concluding remarks, President Bush has made the challenge by insisting on the tax cut and then also linking it to the current Iraq war. If that policy is successful and that policy is viewed politically as a good move by Bush, we will be seeing those changes in the next decade. We will be seeing those changes in the textbooks in the next decade. Wasn't JFK the first modern president to promote the idea of tax cuts to stimulate the economy? Well, that's a good question, and he did help. Remember that I mentioned Roosevelt got the economy up to, or the tax rate up to 90%? Well, it was 70, remember I said when Reagan got in? That cut from 90 to 70 was under Kennedy. And interestingly enough, and this was very much observed by the people in Reagan's administration, the taxes were cut in the Kennedy administration from 90% to 70%, the revenue also took a jump. And so what we had was revenue taking a jump with the taxes cut, which is counterintuitive. It's exactly what Reagan tried. It's exactly what worked in the 1980s. Yeah. Okay, this is going to be a little bit of change of pace, Bert. Would you please comment on FDR's conduct of World War II, his successes and his shortcomings? Yeah. His optimism was a, was a big success in conducting the war. His willingness to spend money in some ways worked to his advantage. Now remember, our military debt went from about, we came into the war with a national debt of about $40 billion. We came out of the war with a national debt of about $250 billion. Now, a load of that money was misspent. There's no question about it. But Bernard Baruch, the industrialist, said, you can always justify spending too much. You can't justify spending too little. <laughs> With Roosevelt, you didn't have to ask him twice to spend too little. So in that respect, even though program after program could be documented as unsuccessful, we also began to turn out ships, planes, in massive amounts. We had very good incentives to those people to produce. And the war machine, what can you say? It was a successful war machine. Here's another World War II question. There's a school of thought that says FDR was alerted to Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor enough in advance to significantly reduce the success of the attack. Is that true or not? I would simply, there is some evidence for certain, for sure, that information about the Japanese attack crossed Roosevelt's decks in the week before. The challenge to historians who are critical of Roosevelt on this point has always been to say that he absorbed it knew about it, and allowed it to happen. Because, see, there was all sorts of information that was crossing Roosevelt's desk in a week or two. Well, the Japanese are going to attack in the Philippines. The Japanese are going to delay attacking for three months. 
I tend on this point to be somewhat sympathetic with Roosevelt. Although he did not cry many tears when the attack came because it gave him the justification to go to war, which he felt was necessary to do, Roosevelt, it's hard to imagine, given the ego that he had, would have allowed that much damage and to have our fleet there at Pearl Harbor and to allow that damage if he'd known about it and really operated it in the <coughs> I'll read again that quote, and I'll just ask you this. This is, again, it's, it comes with knowing the man and the temperament. And we're all this way. I mean, we're this way with our kids, right? Would my kid be the one to steal that cookie out of the cookie bowl, which is missing? Usually it's yes, he would be. But in this case, you look at Roosevelt and say, would the man who was confident and full of ego after beating, winning the biggest electoral landslide in American history in 1936, winning in 1940, his desire to become the first three-term president had been fulfilled, and of course he was going to go for four. Would someone like that, who wrote Churchill and said, I know you will not mind my being brutally frank when I tell you, that I think I can personally handle Stalin better than either you, your foreign office, or my State Department. Does that sound like someone who would willingly and knowingly allow our fleet to be blown up by the Japanese? I think not. I think not. Just back on an economics question. Please comment on Margaret Thatcher's influence on Ronald Reagan, and specifically comment on her University of Chicago background. Chicago oh. School. Yeah. Uh, there, there's no question that, that Margaret Thatcher and Reagan were thinking alike. I would not so much say she had influence on Ronald Reagan, as much as to say that they were similar spirits who assumed executive position at roughly the same time, Thatcher in 1979, Reagan the next year in 1980. They liked each other personally. And there you have Margaret Thatcher you know, privatizing Heathrow Airport, privatizing all of this Poor urban housing. Oh, the Labor Party was so upset because all those people who got to buy their own house cheaply started voting conservative. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, with Reagan and Thatcher, of course, Thatcher had a worse tax or, or Chicago background for anyway. Uh, the tax rate in England, when she got in, was not 70%, which Reagan faced, it was 98%. It was 98%. Yeah, those people thought we can't quite go with FDR all the way. But almost, 98%. You got to keep 2%. Now, this is on top incomes again. This is not across the board on lower. But it was a, a progressive tax that had its top level at 98%. Well, Thatcher really whacked that down. And again, we get more British investment coming from that. So there, I would say that, that Thatcher and Reagan are similar spirits who both assumed high office in their countries at almost the same time, and then enjoyed one another's success almost as much as they enjoyed their own success. Go ahead. Hey, here's a topic that you have not addressed yet, but how did Eleanor affect FDR's presidency? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting reading the Eleanor Roosevelt correspondence and uh, her, her whole influence uh, to some extent on the Roosevelt presidency, he would often tell Eleanor, you're my eyes and ears. Because, of course, he was in a wheelchair, and she would go out as kind of an ambassador from place to place. But every time that I've looked at where she came back and told him something, he had his fingers in his ears. Uh, he wasn't really listening. It's very difficult to point to any particular program that Eleanor Roosevelt actually <coughs> influenced. People like Ray Moley, uh, Sam Rosenman, people who were part of the Brains Trust, they commented later in books, and people would ask them, and they said, we never had Eleanor around when we were making decisions. We never had her around. And so her influence was actually very, very slender on the Roosevelt presidency. Now, interestingly, she began to have a lot of influence in the United States as kind of an ambassador of goodwill after Roosevelt's death. She was kind of the first lady, even though her, pre her husband was dead, she was still kind of the, the nation's first lady. And she was used by Truman and even in the late stages by Kennedy for various types of missions to the United Nations and so on. So she captured in the American mind kind of a spirit that this is kind of an 
indomitable woman who is a principled woman who has ideas. And people sort of read that back into the Roosevelt presidency, thinking, well, because she was that way, she must have had an enormous influence on Franklin Roosevelt. But I have yet to find sources that say she was there with us on any policy decision. And I have yet to come across any particular bill that can be attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. Although she did do a few things. She helped invite Marian Anderson, the black woman, to Washington, D.C., to sing. So she was there uh, at the Lincoln Memorial. She was there for symbolic gestures. She, she could help with interest groups in the Democratic Party and help with this sort of thing. Policy decision, I just can't find it. OK, this will be the final question. Everybody's always interested in how presidents are ranked. And FDR, even I just noticed a Federalist Society survey today, FDR continues to be ranked even highly by the curmudgeons in the Federalist Society. He's number three. Really? How would you rank FDR uh, personally and give your criteria and, and who would be higher, who would be lower? How does it all mix up in your mind? I was asked also to participate in, in two different presidential polls. The Roper poll that was conducted by a group in Florida and written up in, in book form. And the second poll was the Intercollegiate Studies Institute presidential poll that were done. So in, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute poll was one where they asked you to rank great, near great, average, and below average. And so I didn't have an actual numerical ranking of Roosevelt in that one. The other, in the Roper poll, they actually asked for a numerical ranking. Uh, in that poll, this was before uh, the current President Bush was in, so we had what? Let's see, that's 42 presidents. I ended up ranking Roosevelt 41. So when you ask who did I have above him, <laughs> that's a more difficult question to ask than who I had below him. I had one president below him, and that would be Lyndon Johnson. And so those were the two that I put last. I did that, and I put Johnson on bottom for this reason. We spent with Johnson. Roosevelt was very much against having, with the aid to families with dependent children, he was very much against the direct welfare to families incentives that would be wrong-headed incentives. And Johnson was not. And we've, we've had an incredible tragedy uh, in the 60s and 70s with that program. When we eliminated various uh, criteria and various legislation to qualify for federal aid, and it ended up providing incentives uh, for not being married, because you could receive federal aid if you were not married, if you were married, you would not receive federal aid. Roosevelt was very much against that. Johnson was not. And so that program uh, has been such a disaster in our history, unfortunately, because of the incentive structure that it put in place that I ended up uh, wrecking, wrecking Johnson uh, before Roosevelt. Well, thank you very much, Professor Bert Colson. Thank you very much for coming out and joining us this Veterans Day. I hope you have a safe drive home.